had a little bit of a struggle with that, but I think we got the message out there anyway. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. If only more folk and more churches would realize that, amen. There'd be a whole lot less uh, junk floating around. You wouldn't see as much garbage on television as you do, and some of these preachers, what they have to say. But you see, when you lose sight of the fact you're a sinner saved by grace, then, honey, you've lost sight of everything. Amen. At that point, you might as well, if you're preaching, you need to stop preaching. Amen. If you're testifying, you need to stop testifying. If you're trying to tell your neighbor about Jesus, you need to shut your mouth and not say anything. Because if you've lost sight of the fact that you're a sinner saved by grace, then I've got news for you. You have nothing to offer anybody else. Amen. Because every neighbor you've got, every person you testify, every person you preach to, preacher, can see that you're a human being. The only one you're fooling is you. Amen. I think some of these preachers on TV, these bunch of knuckleheads like Rod Parsley and and uh, Pat Robertson and some of these goombas, the only the only person who believes the press that, that's out about them is them. Amen. Because I heard, I heard Pat Robertson say some things this week that are about the dumbest things I've ever heard a man speak in my life. So it doesn't, you know, I don't need anybody to tell me the man's human and he makes mistakes and he's faulty. I can see that. When you're blaming Hurricane Katrina on Ellen DeGeneres because she's a lesbian and because they're going to have her hosting the Emmy Awards, and the last time Ellen DeGeneres was going to host uh, the, the awards, why, that's when 9-11 hit. So every time she is about to be involved in something, God strikes judgment on this nation. Oh, give me a break. But you see, you know, these people think that everybody in the world is just dumb, and they, none of us looking at him thinking, buddy, you need to go get you some Prozac or something because something's wrong with you. You need, you need some Alzheimer's medication because something is just ain't working in your brain right. You see what I'm saying? But when you remember that you're a sinner saved by grace, then you don't have a word of condemnation. The Bible said, he who is, or they who are forgiven much love much. And you see, if, if you don't learn to accept God's forgiveness, so a lot of people out there, I'm going to tell you, that are so hard on themselves because they have made it up in their mind that God is hard on them. Amen. They've got it in their mind that God is hard on them. And when they believe that God is hard on them, they then in turn become even harder on themselves. And you know what? If they would learn to accept the grace and love of God, what would happen is they'd be set free and all of a sudden they'd find out that whether their neighbor's a homosexual, whether their neighbor's a drunkard, whether their neighbor is a prostitute, whether their neighbor's a drug pusher, it don't matter. They'd love them just the same. Amen. Whether their neighbor's black, whether their neighbor's white, whether their neighbor's Asian, whether their neighbor's Hispanic, they'd love them just the same. Amen. See, when you learn to accept God's grace and love, you're able then to give God's grace and love. I preached a message here recently talking about you can only give what you got. Amen. You can't give anything more than you perceive. But if you've been in a church where they've been pushing a bunch of condemnation and guilt, well, guess what you tend to put out? Condemnation and guilt. That's all you've got. <laughs> and if that's all you got, that's all you can give. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning and you'd open them, please, to John chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Very, very common portion of Scripture. But I think there's something very interesting in this this morning for us to see. John chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, if we stand this morning in honor of the reading of God's Word, today I read from the King James text, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger 
wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Oh, hallelujah. I think you're going to get real tickled out of this message this morning. The Lord just put something in my spirit that touches me, and I think you're going to enjoy it. Master, this morning we need the anointing. We need the presence of Almighty God. Lord, if I would be a help to anyone, if any person could possibly find any encouragement in any words that would come out of this preacher's mouth, Lord, it's not because of me. It's because of you. It's because of the Holy Ghost. It's because of the presence of a living God that rides upon the words of truth. Oh, God, make every word truth this morning that it might carry your spirit, Lord, as it goes out over the internet, as it goes out through our tape ministry, let the anointing and presence of God go with it, so that every heart will be touched, Lord, that every person will be changed, every person will be inspired this morning to accept your grace, which is freely offered, for we ask it this morning in none other than the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, praise God, and amen. You may be seated this morning. Isn't it funny how religious folks are always on the lookout for folks doing the wrong thing? It never ceases to amaze me that the more spiritual folks are, the more they can find fault with everybody around them. Oh, yeah, baby. You know, I love this, and I love picking on cults. You know I love to pick on cults, but... Cults make me laugh because, you know, they appeal to people because they always come across as being far more spiritual. Well, of course they're far more spiritual. You know why? Because they can find what's wrong with everybody. You go to the Kingdom Hall, they'll tell you what's wrong with everybody. The Lutherans, I'll tell you what's wrong with the Lutherans. The, the Catholics, I'll tell you what's wrong with the Catholics. The Pentecostals, I'll tell you what's wrong with the Pentecostals. The Baptists, I'll tell you what's wrong with the Baptists. The Methodists, I'll tell you what's wrong with the Methodists. Well, is there any group you can't find fault with? Oh, yes called the Watchtower Bible Society. We're the perfect people. Am I right? Oh, I know I'm right. But you see, Tommy, it's not just there. You go up to Salt Lake City, it's the same crap, different day. Amen. And there you got your Mormons, and they'll do the same garbage. Well, here's the problems with this one. Here's the problems with that one. Here's the problems with this one. Here's the problem with that. And they'll point out the problems of everybody. Because sometimes the only way people think and remember that I said people think that you can lift yourself up is by putting others down. But see, Jesus taught us differently than that. He helped us to understand that the best way to be exalted was to debase yourself. He said, if you want to be lifted up, don't put everybody else around you down. As a matter of fact, said, do just the opposite. You assume the lowly position. You assume the lowest position. And then let somebody come to you and offer to lift you up. And then you'll have honor. So you go to a wedding, don't be expecting because you're the pastor. I remember in my first church years ago, uh, Frankie and Suzanne got married. Well, they had already arranged, before they started coming to my church, they had already arranged to get married at Dan Mariano's church. You remember Dan Mariano in uh, Danbury? Dan's a wonderful man. He was an assembly God preacher. I loved him. He was a terrific guy, just a great guy. Uh, his wife had a uh, debilitating disease, and she was in a wheelchair for many, many years, and that man just doted on her and waited on her and cared for her. And to be a pastor and have to do that, I mean, you know, it was amazing. It was a lot of work for that man to have to do. But I, I 
when they came to me and they said, Brother Mar, you know, we already made plans with Brother Mariano to do our wedding and we're so sorry. And I said, that's okay, that's okay. See, I'm not one of them preachers that I have to do everything. I'm not one of those preachers I've got to be up in front of the whole thing all the time, every time. They said, well, we'll include you in the wedding somehow. I said, honey, please understand me. If, if, if I'm invited to go, I'm happy. Hey, I get a free dinner out of the deal. I said, if I'm invited to go, I'm happy. So what they had me do is they had me address the, the group at the reception and pray the prayer over the food and all that. You know, but I didn't care because that's, that's not what it's all about. And I didn't assume that I'd be sitting at the head table, even though that's where they wanted me to be, but I didn't assume that. Do you see what I'm saying? Because my Bible tells me that when you go into a meeting of this nature, a wedding or a celebration, the Bible says, you take the lower place. And if they bid you come higher, then you go higher. He said, the Lord says, but don't you be assuming that you're going to sit up higher and then be embarrassed when in walks Senator so-and-so, who's a bigger guest than you are, and they have to ask you to step down so Senator so-and-so can have your seat. Oh, wouldn't that be embarrassing? Amen. But some people believe the only way they can elevate themselves is to put everybody else down. And you know what? In carnal minds, that works. Did you hear that? In carnal minds, not in spiritual minds, in carnal minds, that works. That's why the Jehovah's are getting people to come to their outfit. That's why the Mormons are getting people to come to their outfit. Because that mentality appeals to carnal minds. Yeah, put everybody else down. And we're the only ones that are in the know. We're the only ones that got the goods. We're the only ones that really know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. That works for me. Yeah, of course. That works for carnal-minded people. But my Bible said to be carnally-minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. So I'd much rather have a spiritual mind than a carnal mind. But you know, the religious folks always can find the fault in everybody else. They can find trouble where there is no trouble. I remember a little old lady in my one, two, three, fourth church. Sister Carpenter in my fourth church years ago in Pennsylvania. And this little lady, bless her heart, she said, Brother Marlon, I like to go out and do things, and I like to go out and have a good time. And she was in her, I think she was almost 80 years old, about 78 years old, little old white lady, you know. And she and Brother Carpenter had married some years before. They were both with it, and they, it was the second marriage. She said, but my husband said, let not the world be to the things that are in the world, bless God. And she couldn't do anything. Because she wasn't supposed to love the world. She wasn't supposed to love anything in the world. She wasn't supposed to be able to go to a movie. She wasn't supposed to be able to visit with her children or do anything. Because this guy just could find fault in everything. So I said to him one day, I said, Brother Carpenter, let me ask you, Carpenter, let me ask you a question. I said, if the Lord was to come... And somebody sitting in that movie house watching Star Wars, and they love Jesus, and they're looking for him to return. I said, let me ask you a question. Do you honestly believe after the trumpet's blown, they're still going to be sitting there watching Star Wars? Well, no. I said, well, why do you suppose they, they would be taken? Well, because they love the Lord more than they love Star Wars. I said, exactly. Your wife can do a lot of things in the world. The Bible said to be in the world, but not of the world. You can do a lot of things in the world without loving those things more than you love God. Amen? The Bible said that there, in the last days, men would be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, but that doesn't mean that you're supposed to not like any pleasure at all. Food is pleasant. Food provides pleasure. When you put it on your tongue, you know, it tastes good. Every time we read the word pleasure, of course, most churches immediately it becomes sexual. Because God knows that's the only pleasure there is in all the world. Well, some of these preachers, that's all the pleasure they got because they can't do nothing else. So you see, the point is, 
were lovers of pleasures. The Bible said that there would be those who are lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. But what about those who enjoy the pleasure, but they sure aren't going to let that pleasure surplant their love for God? Do you understand what I'm saying? So that doesn't mean they've given up pleasure altogether. It just means that pleasure has its place, and God has a greater place. Amen. I don't, well, I don't know if I say this or not. I don't care how much you like Nookie. When 9 o'clock Sunday morning comes, then this is where I'm going to be. Amen. I can like Whoopi as much as the next guy, and I don't mean Whoopi Goldberg. But when it comes to being in the house of God, there is not a thing in this world that's going to keep me from being here at the appointed time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because I am not a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. My love for God surpasses my love of pleasure. Amen? So you get a clue what I'm talking about now. All right. So there are those people who believe that they have to put other people down in order to lift themselves up. Well, here come the scribes and Pharisees, and they bring a woman to Jesus. And bless God, we've caught her. <laughs> Lord, we got her. We didn't get her. She didn't admit to it. We caught her in the very act. What were you doing? Where were you? That's what I want to ask people sometimes when they tell me about everybody else's sin and everybody else's. Where are you at anyway? How in the world would you know about that? How in the world could you even begin to venture a guess about that in that person's life? How? Where, where, where do you get that? What did those scribes and Pharisees have to be doing in order to catch her in the act? Just about. You see, if you look at Middle Eastern culture today, it's very much the way it was then. It still is in the Middle East. You go to certain countries like Iran and uh, countries of this nature where the Muslim law tends to prevail in the land, and you'll find that they have morality police who run around watching and looking and constantly being on guard. If a girl in their culture is dressed in jeans and a shirt instead of wearing her, you know, veil all the way down to her toes and covered every part of her body, immediately she's looked at suspect. So she's going to be the first one they're going to watch more closely. So maybe this lady had done something that made them look at her a little more closely. Maybe she kind of given a clue that something wasn't quite right. You know, I saw Margaret leave for work the other day. She, she goes down the street and she works with that tailor down there and helps his wife fix people's robes and stuff. And shortly after Margaret left, I see little Martha over here, you know, sneaking up into her house. Now, there ain't nobody home but her husband. Aha! You see what I'm saying? So they must have seen something that led them to believe that something wasn't right. So now they lay in wait because, well, we've got enough evidence that something's going on. So now we're just going to sit here outside the bedroom window and we're going to wait. And when they finally catch the two in the act, this is the part that always cracks me up. They grab the woman. <laughs> they grab the woman. Oh, the man's standing there butt naked, but ain't nobody bothering him. He can get his clothes on. He can act like it never happened. He can, you know, ignore the fact. But boy, they grab that woman up. And they bring her to Jesus, and they have the audacity to point to the law and say, Lord, the law says that in this situation, this woman ought to be stoned. And you know what? I love the fact that the Lord didn't even indulge them in their foolishness. Right. Because he very well could have turned around and said to them, where's the man? Yes, he could have. That's right. Because didn't you read, if you're talking about the law, why, why didn't you talk about the whole law? 
That's why I love when I talk to people who want to come to me with Scripture and tell me all kind of stupidity and try to make it sound like they got something that we ain't got because they're so smart and we ain't so smart. And I just love to talk to people. I say, well, you know what? While you're reading that verse, why don't you just read the 100? Come on now. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Doesn't mean butchering and tearing it up. The, the tear up scripture like nothing you've ever seen is the JW, the Je- Jehovah's Witness. They tear that Bible to smithereens. I sit there with some of them folks in my house, and they'd be sitting there trying to quote this verse out of here and this verse over here and this verse over here. And you know what? They're taking every bloody thing they're talking out of context. Every word out of their mouth is out of context. Not one single thing they have to say, not one ounce of it, is within the context of what's written. They just whoop, pull it right out of the middle of something. Just like these scribes and Pharisees did this day with Jesus. Whoop, just pull out the fact that the woman needs to be stoned, but what's, where's the man? Where's the other party in this situation? It's awful hard to commit adultery by yourself. Come on now. It's awful hard to commit adultery by yourself. Where's the other person? Because according to the law, there's a punishment for that person as well. But instead, the Bible says, rather than even indulging them with any form or fashion of answer, the Scripture said the Lord kind of knelt down and he, he drew something in the sand. And I think God kind of helped me to understand just exactly what he drew. Because I've always wondered... And I've always heard preachers preach it, and I've always heard it said that he started writing names of sins, and that's so stupid. Every time I think about that. Now, how do you get that out of what's written? It doesn't say nothing to the effect of he began to write down sins or nothing. It just said he drew in the sand. And I realized, oh, okay, what he really did was he drew a straight line from left to right. And the scripture says, he kind of stopped for a minute, and they said, well, come on, what's the answer? Tell us, that what are we supposed to do? The Bible said a second time he went down. This time he drew a straight line forward to that. He drew a line in the sand. You ever heard the old saying, oh, he crossed the line? You know, when there's a certain distance people can go with you and if they go just one step beyond that it's too far you've heard the old saying that somebody be in an argument and they say they draw a line in the sand and say now if you step over that line I'll deck you as long as you stay over there you're okay but I'm going to draw this line right here in the sand and if you go over that line I'm going to deck you I'll knock you right down on your rear end Jesus was drawing a line in the sand. And then he said, here's the conditions of my line in the sand. Let he that is without sin cast the first stone. Who's willing to cross that line? Who's able to step over that line? You want to do it? There's the line. Step over it. Come on, baby, do it. You want to? I've drawn a line in the sand. You want to throw the rock? Go ahead. I'll let you. I'll watch you. I'll help you. I'll pick up a stone for you. Just so long as you can show me that you stand before me without sin today. Mm. All of a sudden, the scripture says. Not in the, the text that we read this morning, but elsewhere you read how that the men begin, they begin to think and contemplate and realize, looking at their own lives, they begin to realize that, well, that, I certainly don't qualify. I've got sin in my life. And the Bible says that they begin to walk off one at a time from the oldest to the youngest. And I thought, Lord, if that ain't the way, if that ain't the way. Because you know what, Mother? The oldest are always the ones that are more quickly willing to admit. They've got the wisdom of life. They've got the passage of years, the passage of time. 
My great-grandmother began so bless her heart. In my eyes, she was a saint of God. But if you ask her, she'd be the first one to tell you, Honey, I've got my faults. You see what I'm saying? Because as much as I adored her and I thought the world of her, she never believed anybody's press about herself. She knew she still had failings. She knew she still had faults. Because with the passage of time, there's some mellowing that occurs. And there's, there's something that happens in the human psyche. And we begin to kind of mellow out a little bit and realize what's going on in the world. And we're not as gung-ho and not as crazy about issues as we were when we were young. So that's why they begin to pop off. They started out with the younger, or the older, and then they went right on down to the younger. Because the younger boy, they're going to hold out to the end. Bless God, I'm about to go with that line. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm about to. Oh, I tell you what, mm, girl. Mm, I'll tell you. Yeah, I see a good rock right over there. I'm gonna go get it. I'm, t I'm telling you, girl. Who? I'm only 22 years old, and I know a hoe when I see a hoe, and I'm gonna stone you. But the more they thought about it, the more they realized they couldn't do that. You know, it's interesting. Out of that group of people that the Lord had. And this is an important point I want you to get this morning. Out of that group of people who were in the Lord's presence that day, there was not one hypocrite. Right, that's right. Yes, that's right. Did you hear me? I bet you that's something you never thought of before, is it? Right. That you never considered that, but that's the truth. There was not one hypocrite because nobody threw a stone. They would have to have been a hypocrite to have thrown a stone. But nobody threw a stone. They were all willing to acknowledge that they themselves had sinned as well and walk away. Right. So not one hypocrite in the crowd. The Lord drew the line in the sand. And guess what? Not one hypocrite was willing to cross it. Because to cross that line, you become a hypocrite. But to stay on this side of the line, you at least stay true to yourself and to your God. Amen. I, I've had people, I've talked to people and preached and talked to people and, and they say, well, but how can you preach and say, well, you're a hypocrite if you're preaching. I said, honey, I ain't a hypocrite to nothing. There ain't nothing I do that I don't preach. And there ain't nothing I preach that I don't do. I'm not going to get up here and preach something that I, and then, and then turn around and go out and do the opposite because I know that'd be hypocrisy and I'm not stupid. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to stand here and preach something and then turn around. I know what my weaknesses are. I know what my failings are. But that's one reason why I haven't got the right to try to help pull that, that stick out of your eye when I've got one in my own. Amen? Preacher or not. That was Jimmy Swagger's problem. He was busy trying to get a little toothpick out of everybody in the church's eyes. Yes, oh, bless God, you know, y'all y'all kiss on first dates and you shouldn't. And y'all hold hands in the movies and you shouldn't. And y'all are petting. And all the while he's hiring a prostitute to do private puppet shows for him. Preacher or not, if you ain't got it under control, preacher, you better watch what you got to say about it. Amen. My Bible said, Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. If any man be overtaken in a fault, they which are spiritual ought to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. If you ain't got it under control, brother. You, you need to keep your, your mouth shut. You understand what I'm saying? I acknowledge there have been many times I've gotten in the pulpit and I've said... Boy, I had a bad week this week. I acted like the jerk said things I should have never said. Screamed and cussed and hollered and carried on like some kind of lunatic. Haven't I? I've said it right from the pulpit. Because I'm not going to be a liar and I'm not going to be a hypocrite. Amen. You know what? If you can do it, I can do it. Come on now. You have bad days, I have bad days. We all have bad days. But the difference is, I'm not going to stand up here like a lot of preachers do, try to act like it never happens to me. I know a lot of preachers get up, well, they just put on a show every Sunday, like they're Mr. Perfect, you know, and they have never cussed, or they have never had a bad day. Baloney. 
I tell you how I know baloney, because I've been around these preachers when they've had their bad days. And because I was another preacher, they felt comfortable being themselves, and they just let it all fly. You hear me now? You're a church member. They won't do it in front of you. But when they're around another preacher, they just let it all go. You hear what I'm saying? So I know they're human. I know they're flesh and blood. But I'm also smart enough to know, Lord, I ain't going to get up and say something and then turn around and have it be the very thing that in my life I struggle with. And then I'm going to stand there looking like a hypocrite and a fool. Now, I'm not going to do that. The Lord drew a line in the sand. But he didn't just draw one line. Scripture said he actually got down twice and he drew a second line. You see, I don't know about you, but... There's an interesting pattern when you cross two lines that way. You create a cross. <laughs> and the Lord was saying, and I'm just covered in goosebumps right now. The Lord was saying, if you think you've got it, then you just step over the cross. You want to get to her to stone her, then you just step over the cross. That's my line in the sand, the cross of Calvary. <laughs> you think you got something against her, then just step over the cross. If you think you are able to condemn her, then just step over the cross. But you know what? Today there's not a human being in the midst of us that can step over that cross. There's not a one. There's not a one of us so perfect and so sinless and so good that we have the right or the responsibility to step over the cross of Calvary and condemn anybody. Right. And I tell them the truth today. Amen. I want to just give you a couple quick scriptures. Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. The Lord said, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it will be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote that is in thy, thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite! You've crossed the line! You've stepped over the cross! You've crossed the line! Thou hypocrite, the Lord says, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Brother, I'll tell you, I, I say, God, help me never to cross that line. Amen. Help me never to cross that line. Help me never to cross that line in the sand. Help me never to step over the cross of Calvary and think that somehow, some way, I've got something more than I've got, that I have the right to condemn somebody. Matthew 23, 23 through 28 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Who was it that brought this woman to him, the scribes and Pharisees? He said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Oh, my word. For ye pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. The, law, the Lord is saying that there are aspects of the law that are of greater weight than tithing. There are aspects of the law that are of greater weight and greater importance. You know what? There are people in the church today, in the church world today, who think that certain issues are so important, and what they don't understand is there are far more important issues than what they're preaching. Hello now. And the Lord says to them, you have omitted the weightier matters of the law, and what are they? Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone, ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Why are they hypocrites? Because they're crossing the line. For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Not homosexuality, 
They're not full of homeless. He didn't say they're full of homosexuality. He said they're full of extortion and excess. You know, it's funny, you go today, you go down to City Hall in Dallas, and I'll tell you right now that half of those city councilmen are the most corrupt, vile human beings that ever walked the face of planet Earth. And you know why? I'll tell you why. Because they're full of extortion and excess. It ain't about their sex life. It's about what they're willing to do and how easily and how readily they're willing to do their neighbor in for a buck and how they don't care about the poor, and how they don't care about the needy, and how they don't care about those that are less fortunate in their community, as long as it'll put another few dollars in their pocket. Why do you think we got the FBI down there now doing a great big old investigation? Because the FBI has nothing better to do? No. But you see, these are the same people a lot of times who will stand there and preach at you and I. And well, but your lifestyle ain't acceptable to God. But who you are is not acceptable to God. Oh, but who you are is? Hello now. Who you are is? My Bible said the love of money is the root of all evil. Not the love of sex. The love of money is the root of all evil. So I got news for you. If you think that sexual sins are the worst sins on the planet, honey, you're way off. You're way off. God's way more concerned with people who do one another dirty for a buck. Do you hear me now? You read why in you read in the Old Testament prophets why Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, and you know what homosexuality isn't even on the list. But I'll tell you what the Bible tells us very plainly that extortion and excess were. It'll tell you they had fullness of bread and pride and that they did not care for the needy and they did not care for the poor in their community. That's what God is concerned about. So while we got preachers running around like Rob Persley preaching gay, lesbian people into hell, they're ignoring the fact that half their congregation is screwing their neighbor for a dollar. But God forbid he should preach on that because he's motivated by money, too, and he don't want to lose a single member he's got because it takes a lot of money to keep that big building going. My Lord, have mercy. I say it sometimes, don't I? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and the body. You make a lot of God. He said, but cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Lord Jesus, help me never to cross the line in the sand. Help me to be mindful, I sang the song, that I'm always, forever, a sinner saved by grace. You know what? As long as I remember that, that'll keep me on this side of the cross. Amen? As long as I remember that, that'll keep me on this side of that line. Amen. And I thank God today that the Lord drew that line in the sand. Because you know what? That wasn't just for those few men who had brought that woman to him that day. That was for all of humanity. That was for every human being that would ever walk on the face of planet Earth. He said, here's the line. I don't want you to cross it. But if you're so perfect that you believe you're, you're able, well, by all means, have a party. Go for it. But you know what? With whatever judgment you judge, you're going to be judged. With whatever meet you, measure you meet, it shall be meted back to you. You throw stones at her, said, honey, don't be surprised when I'm sitting as God in heaven, pelting you with rocks. Right. Hello now. Because you're going to get it back. I love people think God's teasing when they said, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. I love when people fail to realize that is not about God doing anything to you. It's about the natural order of things. You plant a seed, you're going to get what you planted. What 
you put out there is what you're going to get back. What you put in here is what you're able to put out. Do you see why our source always needs to be God? Amen. Because that way he's putting it in, we're putting it in. It's coming out and we're getting back positive things because it all originated with God to begin with. But if we're out there getting a bunch of negative garbage and we're planting that, then honey, all we're getting back up from the ground is a...